And I want to take you back to the 1990s for just a moment and a song. It was a popular song in the Christian church, probably still sung uh, in many churches around the country today. But have you ever heard that song, Here I Am to Worship? You ever heard that song, Here I Am to Worship? Uh, the lyrics go like this, light of the world, you stepped down into darkness, opened my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made this heart adore you, hope of a life spent with you. And then the chorus, here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God. You're altogether lovely, altogether worthy, altogether wonderful to me. Now, I don't know if you're paying attention, maybe it's wrote lyrics you've heard many times before, but do you hear how many eyes are in that song? Altogether wonderful to who? To me. You know, the Western world, the American church is so good at individualizing everything and making all that God did in his glory all about me, all about me. But what about them as it were? That song finishes up, it says this, well, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon the cross, and I would hazard to say this, in all honesty, I don't know that I'd want to. I don't know if I'd want to experience that, and I guarantee you the American church doesn't want to experience the cost of light coming down, entering this world of darkness, and what it cost Christ for us, for our sin, paying the price of sin and for our salvation. Light of the world, you came down into darkness. Yes, here I am, here we are to worship. In other words, the response of the song, it says, light of the world, you came down into darkness, and my response then is to worship you, to bow down, to say that you're lovely, you're beautiful, you're, you mean everything to me. Yes, that should be our response of Christ coming down, of light into the world and into darkness. But you gotta ask yourself the question, is that it? Like, is it just about worshiping and singing songs and lifting our hands, or are we not called to something more? In fact is, we are. Yes, here we are to worship, but more than that, we have been called and we're expected to get after it, to work on his behalf. To not just sing of what he did, but to follow in his footsteps and give of ourselves sacrificially so that others too can live. Others too can know him as we do. It seems in our era, and particularly in the West, in the American church, we're caught up in the worship side of things and not the work side of things. Self-absorption in our own individual lives and in the American church versus sac sacrifice and giving our lives away as he gave his life away so that others could come to know him as we do. You know, Harry mentioned that today is the first of four Sundays of Advent. Uh, the first four Sundays leading up to Christmas, that word goes all the way back into Latin and prior to that into Greek. It simply means an arriving, a, a looking ahead to, an arriving, a coming. And of course you would think, well, we're looking ahead in these four Sundays to the birth of Christ uh, and the coming, as it were, 2,000 years of Christ, of light entering into the world of darkness. Uh, but that wasn't always the way it was. In fact, originally Advent uh, was a 40-day period of preparation that led to uh, what's called the Epiphany, January 6th, the Three Kings. In some countries around the world, they still celebrate the Three Kings, the Epiphany, the, the wise men coming to visit the baby Jesus. And originally, Advent was a season that led up to that, of uh, a time of 40 days of prayer and fasting in which penitents, people who would repent and give their lives to Christ, would prepare themselves through prayer and fasting for baptism that would happen on January 6th. Uh, it was only years later in the 6th century that Advent became part of uh, and really tied to Christmas, to the Christmas story and to the arrival of Christ. We celebrate the birth and uh, uh, the manger, etc. Uh, but today it's mostly rightly celebrated, kind of a half and half thing. So technically the first two Sundays of Advent are looking ahead to the arrival of, of the coming king, the second coming of Christ, uh, someday to, to rule on David's throne forever and ever, establish pre peace and justice in the world, Isaiah chapter 9. And then the second two Sundays leading up to Christmas, of course, looking ahead and celebrating the birth of Jesus as we do on Christmas. All of that is about Advent. And in this season, these next four uh, or five weeks, we've called it a thrill of hope, these five messages all in this season of Advent. And I want to begin today with this first message talking about light that shines in the darkness. Light that shines in the darkness. What is light? You ever ask yourself that question? What is light, and how is it that you and I can see? Uh, when you look, and I, trust me, I'm not a great science guy in physics and all that, but I looked it up for this message, and there are two types of objects when it comes to light and the understanding of light and how we see, and the first is called a luminous object. 
luminous objects uh, generate their own light, right? So what is a luminous object? The sun. The sun is classified a luminous object. It generates its own light, right? Now, of course, we can't see light uh, unless maybe there's some dust particles in the air, water particles, you might see a beam of light, but, but on a clear day, you won't see light. You can see the sun, it's a luminous object that generates its own light, but you don't actually see the light beams, right? But it lights up dark things, right? In the absence of light, there's what? Darkness. A luminous object is like the sun, and the sun generates its own life. What else is a luminous object? Fire. You light a fire, it generates its own light. That light bulb right above your head, all these light bulbs on electricity, they generate their own light and therefore they are called luminous objects. The second thing though in this uh, understanding of what is light and how do we see is what are called illuminated objects. Illuminated objects don't generate their own light, but they are otherwise lit up by things like fire, the sun, or a light bulb, right? So there's the luminous objects that generate their own light, and then there's the illuminated objects that don't generate light, but get lit up by the light. You with me? So when you think about this, what is light and how do we see luminous objects and illuminated objects? The sun, again, is an example of a luminous object. What is the moon? An illuminated object. The moon doesn't generate its own light. It only reflects the light of the sun. This podium right here is an illuminated object, right? Me, I'm an illuminated object this moment. You see me because the light, this luminous object of electricity generating this light shines on me and then it shines into your eyes and the complexity of our eye translates that into color, into what you see. In fact, the eye, the complexity of the eye has often been argued for intelligent design. It's so complex, it can't otherwise have evolved, although people try to make it evolve. Clearly, there's intelligent design behind the eye and how it actually works. Well, all that's to say is the sun is an example of a luminous object, the moon, an illuminated object. And all of that takes us to John chapter 1. If you have a Bible, turn there this morning, if you would. John chapter 1, because I want to talk about, on this first Sunday of Advent, light that shines in the darkness. In John chapter 1, we see this, God the Father is a luminous object, as it were, a luminous person, someone who generates his own light, if you will. And in John chapter 1, we're going to see Jesus in his humanity as an illuminated object. Now, of course, we know, illuminated person, Jesus, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we're Trinitarians, we believe in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God and three. But speaking of Jesus in his humanity, in light coming down into darkness and becoming a man, in John chapter 1, we have the Father, as it were, as this luminous person who generates his own light, his own truth, if you will, and Jesus stepping into humanity becomes the illuminated person. And in John 1, it says this, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Later on in verse 14, it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was in the beginning, was God with God, through him all things came into being, and John tells us this Word is not just an inanimate Word, it's actually a person named Jesus. And Jesus came into this world, became flesh, and dwelt among us. Now, in verse 4, it says this, in him, that is Jesus, or the word prior to this, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Men and women, of course, the light was the light of men. So life is in the light, he is the light, and the light shines in the darkness, but the darkness did not understand it. Darkness did not comprehend it. Later on, it's going to say, but to those uh, who did receive this light, who did understand, who gave their lives to Christ, they become the children of God. But not everybody does. John chapter 1. Now, having said that, it says this. No one has seen God at any time. So think of the Father now. No one has ever seen the Father. But the only begotten God, who is the bosom of the Father, he explained him. That is, he illuminated him. So no one, John tells us, has ever seen the Father, right? But who illuminates him? Jesus. So Jesus, the illuminated person, if you will, in his humanity, steps into human history. And when we see Jesus like the sun, right? So the sun shines on me or this light shines on. I can see this podium because light shines on it. Jesus, right? 
the Father, the light shining on Jesus, and then Jesus reflects that light. He illuminates that light. He explains the light of the Father because we saw Jesus. These people literally saw him physically and walked with him on the earth. We see him in the word of God and testimony and what he's done in our lives. But the point is, when we see Jesus, we see the Father, luminous object, luminous person, illuminated person, Jesus in his humanity. You understand what I'm saying? So this is how Jesus steps into humanity, and it says that no one has seen the Father, but since we've seen the Son, we've seen the Father, because he illuminates in his humanity who the Father is, this one who generates life and light. So what do we learn about the Father in the life of Jesus? Of course, many things, but particularly in Matthew 5, again, if you have your Bible, you can turn there. In Matthew 5, Jesus explains some of the personhood and the character of the Father. We learn this in what is commonly called the Beatitudes, right? Jesus says this, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those that, that recognize that we have nothing to offer God, nothing on our own. I, I, I can't offer him anything. Remember the little drummer boy, you bring your drum, it's still not good enough, right? I got nothing. I'm poor in spirit. I'm destitute spiritually, apart from the life and the work of Jesus on my behalf, right? I'm to acknowledge that, to repent of sin, and to give my life to Christ. Blessed are the poor spirit, what do you get for that? Repenting of your sin, eternal life, the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. What does that speak of? Compassion. The way of Christ is the way of compassion, the way of the Father is compassion. You know, we live in a pretty hard-hearted world, don't we? I mean, you got politicians, Democrats, Republicans, everybody trying to destroy themselves at times, right? It's all about burying the opponent, right? But that's not the way of God. The way of God is a compassionate heart. Somebody once said, when you have one finger pointing at the other person, you have what? Three fingers pointing back at you. But we live in a world that wants to destroy the other person and point out the faults of other people. But a compassionate heart recognizes, I'm poor in spirit. Man, I'm no different than you. And it may not be this thing, but it's another thing. And we look with people, look upon people with compassion. This is the way of Christ. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Our God is a gentle God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. They're going to see it. What is hungering and thirsting for righteousness, right? What, what that speaks of is actually Isaiah chapter 9, which Jesus refers to himself. He comes down. Uh, he's that child born. And this child is going to grow up to assume the throne of David, not just for a season, but forever. And when he rules upon that throne, as we look ahead to the coming second, uh, second coming of Christ, he's going to rule, it says, forever and ever on the throne of David and bring justice and peace. That's what it means. This idea of hungering and thirsting after righteousness is all about justice and peace. Being advocates individually and collectively for justice and peace. Because this is ultimately what the rule of God brings to the world, to us, to our lives. Justice and peace. Blessed are the merciful, they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. By the way, there's only one of these beatitudes in which you don't get something for what you do. You are called someone because of what you do. You are identified with someone because of what you do, and that's this one. Blessed are the peacemakers. They get to be called the sons of God. A pure reflection of Father in heaven is peacemakers. And then in verses 10 and 11, it says this, blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say kind, all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for reward in, hev uh, in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who came before you. Now, it's interesting to me that in this list, as it were, of some of the character traits of God and of Christ, and therefore of how we should live as illuminated people of God, right? Uh, it's interesting that two of these Beatitudes have to do with persecution and insult. Like, in other words, it's expected. Here Christ expects that we who have received him and become the children of God, we who illuminate the Father in this life, it's not going to be easy, and you can expect persecution, insult, misunderstanding. You can expect to be maligned. That's an expectation clearly here in the Beatitudes. But we got to ask ourselves this question. When was the last time you were insulted, persecuted, maligned because of him? Now, you might have been misunderstood. You might have been maligned. You might have been insulted because of you. You know what I'm saying? 
Like I could have said something, I could have done something, I get insulted for what I said, I get maligned, I get, that could happen. But when, when was the last time that happened to you because of him? And in, in how you spoke and how you acted and what you did or you didn't do in this life. And an insult or malignment or misunderstanding or maybe you weren't invited to the party. You see, when we think of the persecuted church, we think of the church in China, right? North Korea, in, in places of the Middle East where it, it's so underground, to even to come up above ground, you could risk, you literally get killed, right? Your life, your family. The very first convert in our church was a Muslim man. And he couldn't make it known that he had uh, converted to Christianity for many years because of fear of reprisal, not only in this country, but in the one of his origin, Saudi Arabia. When we think of being persecuted, we often think that is the only way you're persecuted. But in the American context, it's different, right? Thankfully, in this moment, in this season, we're not in threat of being beaten or killed for our faith. But there are other ways that, again, we're misunderstood, insulted, maligned. When you live on point with Jesus, when, when you are living to be illuminated by the light that comes from God, right? Now, now here's the question I have to ask, and, and that can happen in a variety of ways, but here's the point. When was the last time you were maligned in such a way? When was the last time you were misunderstood or mistreated or insulted in one way or another because of him, the way you live your life? And, and the, the, the corollary question is this, if you're not experiencing some measure of persecution, insult, malignment, misunderstanding as you go about your daily business, Work, play, family, what? You gotta ask yourself the question honestly, are we really leaning into this thing? You see what I'm saying? Because the entire Western world and American church is all built around my comfort. It's all about getting my ducks in a row, being in the right environment, being in the right place, having the right friends, being invited to the right party. It's all about this, it's all about our club and all about comfort. And, and, and it's all about worship. That's why I started the song, Here I Am to Worship, right? Who doesn't want to worship? Well, of course we should worship, but what about getting after it? What about going and telling? When was the last time you invited someone to Christ, shared your story of conversion, right? Invited them to come to the collective church. When was the last time you put yourself out there? Because if you're putting yourself out there consistently, according to the Beatitudes, you can expect some measure of pushback. Let's call it pushback. It may not be persecution in the form of death, but some measure of pushback. And if you're not experiencing some measure of pushback from the way you live your life, the actions that you do, the stands that you take, the places you choose to go, the places you choose not to go, you really gotta ask yourself the question, how far am I leaning into this? Remember I said, that song says, right? It, it says, I'll never know how much it cost to see my sins upon the cross, right? And here's the point. Who wants to know that? Nobody. Certainly not in the American church. I don't want to know that cost. I just prefer to have it all nice and I just want to be with my people and, and I just want to make sure everything in my life is all neat and tidy and boy, it's easy to worship God in those environments, isn't it? It's easy to worship God when everything's going well. And America is bent to make sure everything goes well for you and your family. There's nothing wrong with that per se. But see, there's so much more to life. That's the point. There's so much more to this thing called Christianity and faith and Jesus than just making sure you're okay, right? It's about the other. Everything in Christianity is not about you. It's about the other. And it's a cost to give your life away. For the other. So all of that is to say is that God in Christ, God the Father is the luminous light who Jesus comes to reveal who he is and how he lives, how he loves, and we are called to be like him. So if you flip that for a moment, now Christ goes back to heaven, as it were, uh, through crucifixion, resurrection. Now he becomes, of course, the luminous light in his deity. So in his humanity, he's the illuminated light of God. In his deity, he is the light of God. He's the illuminated object, the illuminated person, and we become the illuminated objects. You with me? So Jesus shines, his light, it comes into my heart through repentance of sin and, and forgiveness and, and, and being baptized and walking in newness of life. The light comes into my life. Not that I'm perfect by any means, but I've got the light. I'm no longer in darkness. When I, you know, to him that knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. Why? Because I know what's right to do now. When I didn't have Jesus, I didn't know what's right to do. 
I mean, I might have read the law and obey the traffic and all that, but not really in a moral way. But now I know what's right to do. And if I don't do it, I know I'm in sin. It calls me to repent, ask forgiveness, right? So this light has come to me. So the luminous light of Jesus shines in me and is to shine through me. And I am to illuminate Jesus for others. So again, you don't see me per perfect, but hopefully you see Christ in me. Hopefully you hear Christ in me. And, and, and that light shines, it reflects back to others, and it shines in the darkness. So those who are still in darkness can find their way to the light, just like I did so many years ago. We are therefore to be the illuminated people of God. Now, Jesus actually addresses this in Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, right after these Beatitudes and explaining the character of God, now he goes on to speak of his expectations for us, the people of God. Not only to be poor in spirit and to be merciful and compassionate and peacemakers and pursuing hunger and thirst after righteousness, but he also says this, Matthew chapter 5, 14, he says, you, that is believers, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Now again, we don't generate the light, the light of Jesus illuminates us and we become a reflection of the light in darkness, a light to the world. You, believers, are the light of the world. And a city set on a hill cannot or should not be hidden, right? I guess if you're a city on the hill, you could be hidden because you could turn all your lights out, right? No, nobody can see you in the darkness. But you're not supposed to be a city on a hill with all your lights out. You're supposed to be a city on a hill with it all lit up, right? I, I, I may get this quote wrong, but there's that old quote that says a ship in a harbor is safe, but that's not what a ship is made for. See, a ship isn't meant to sit in the harbor. Oh, look how cool is that ship. Look, man, it can go, you know what I'm saying? It can go the distance. It can get out there, but it just sits in the harbor and everybody looks at it. Like, that's not what a ship's made for. A ship's made to get after it, get people out there, get on the waves and, 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 and get to the other side. But the American church is so much like a ship in a harbor, just playing it safe playing it safe. And the American church is made up of people like you and me, individuals who play it safe. And that's why you really got to ask yourself this question, am I really leaning in? Otherwise playing it safe. He says, you're a light of the world. A city on a hill cannot nor should not be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. Why would you light a lamp and hide it, right? We got that old song from, from children's church and all that, right? Hide it under a bushel, what? No, that's not what a light's for. It's not what a ship's for to play it safe in the harbor. It's meant to be lit and put on a lampstand. Why? Because then it gives light to all who are in the house. That's the purpose of light. So the purpose of light, for instance, as an individual, isn't so that I know Jesus and I read my Bible and I pray and I have my quiet time and I do all. Yeah, hey, that's all important. But is that all to this thing? You see what I'm saying? That's a starting point. That's not the stopping point. Is my light, if you will, hidden in my room? My light is to be out there, the light. I, I gotta get after it, I gotta get out there, right? So that the light of Jesus shines in and through me to affect others in darkness. That's the purpose of the Christian light, right? So it gives light to all who are in darkness. Verse 16, then he says, he ties this idea of letting our light shine, he ties it directly to good works. And I want you to see this, Matthew 5, 16. Let your light shine, therefore, before men, men and women, of course, people, in such a way, how? How am I to let the light shine? Now, again, I don't generate the light, but how is the light of God to be reflected in and through my life so that it affects others in darkness so they come to know Jesus as I do? It says this, let that light shine before men in such a way they see your good, what? Works. Not that they hear your good words, not that they listen to your good worship. You see, words are important. We explain Jesus. Worship is important. It's our response to who God is in prayer and song. And all. Nothing wrong with any of that. We need words. We need worship. It's a right response. But in the absence of works, our light is not shining. In the absence of works, that's us with a light hidden under a bushel. Right? We talk about Jesus. We read about Jesus. We pray to Jesus. But get after it. He says, let your light shine through your good works because then people will see those good works and that's what will reflect who God is and how he loves. They have to see these works. So our light is tied up here. Matthew 5, 16, Jesus says, let your light shine before men in such a way they will see your good works and this will glorify your father in heaven, right? And what that means is it will reflect back on him. 
You know, like if you have a light and it hits a mirror, it goes right back, right? That's the idea. So when I practice more than good words and more than good worship, but I get after it with good works, right? Individually, by the way, and collectively as a church. So me, Mark DeMoz, getting after good works, us collectively, Mosaic, getting after good works, you individually, good works, us collectively, right? That's how we are able to then do good works for people in darkness who then see like light reflected back. Why are all these people here? Why did they do this? Why this Thanksgiving? Why, why whatever it is, right? Why? Because this is who God is. And this is how he loves and extends hope for all, not just some. That light shining into darkness is, according to Jesus, reflected not in good words or in good worship, but in good works, individually and collectively as a church. And this is why you are. That's what I want you to know. This is why you're created. Yes, to know God. Yes, to, to worship him. Yes, to study the word of God and all of that. But to do good works. And by the way, you don't have to be a pastor to do good works. Like, we are all pastors. Did you know that? There's the church scattered and the church gathered. This morning, we are gathered as a church. But the church is nothing more than a gathering of the individual people who make up the body of Christ, right? Through faith in Christ. When you go to your work, teacher, mom, dad, a lawyer, doc, whatever it is, you're in the military or a pastor, wherever you are, you're on mission for God or you're to be on mission for God. You're to be that illuminated person that reflects the light and the love and the life of God to those in darkness, wherever you are, seven days a week. Sunday is not the game. Sunday is the locker room. Are you with me? Monday through Saturday is the game. And you are all the players. I'm a player too. But you're a player. This, you don't just draft off my spirituality. Boy, if you did that, we'd all be in a world of hurt because I'm still struggling and trying to figure out this human body. Okay? You're not to draft off the pastors. You're not to draft off the church. You are the church. You are the pastors. You are the missionaries. You are on mission. And when you leave this place, right, it's to go and serve the Lord and to be an illuminated, to live as an illuminated person reflecting the glory of God and love of God for others. And when you do that, expect insult. And when you do that, expect persecution. And when you do that, malignment. And you won't always get invited to the party. When I was a youth pastor, and I used to go on the high school campuses, uh, you know, it was really clear. I'd walk down the hallway, and some kids would run to me, and some kids would run from me, right? Now, now why is that? Well, I'm not perfect. I'm not Jesus, but I represented, if you will, Jesus. I represented Christ in the school in that moment, right? I'm a youth pastor. So I'm walking down the hall, and it's just like that. Some run to, and some run away, right? And, and, and gosh, I, especially my personality, I want everybody to like me. I want everybody to be happy. We get all get along. Boy, that hurts. That's a little thing. But see what I'm saying? When, when you live like that sometimes, you know, people run from you, not to you. You don't always get invited to the party. Do you understand what I'm saying? Your, your world isn't always comfortable and perfect. But then we go on Facebook and Twitter and all those places, and it looks perfect for others. Like, why not me? Right? Why, why is their life perfect and not mine? Boy, people have been wrestling that for all these years, centuries. Go back to Proverbs song. How come the unrighteous and the unjust seem to get all the toys? All those people not living for God, man, they seem to get, they get everything. Why not me? I mean, the psalmist said, the Proverbs, everybody says that. We've all been saying that. But the thing is, is we don't live for this world. And those who know Jesus don't live for this world. And the cost, yeah, it hurts. And I don't like it. And I wish I was invited to the party. But see, I'm looking for a different party and a different time. And I got to keep my eyes on the prize and stay focused on that. My good works, our collective good works, your good works is what lights up the darkness for others. It's not just about what we know. It's not just how, about how good we sing. It's about what we do. Our works don't save us, amen? What we do for God doesn't save us. It's what he did for us saves us when we embrace that. But what we do for him is our response in gratitude to all he's done for us. Let your light shine before men in such a way they see your good works. And this is what will shine a light on who God is and how he loves. And this is why you are to illuminate others for Jesus. Take a look at this on the screen. This is light hitting a prism. This is a light hitting a prism. 
Now, think about this for a moment. The white line is the Father, is Jesus, right? God. And he's hitting our life. The triangle, and this is a prism, but think about this. Your mind, the three points of who you are, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Because when the light of God comes into your darkened mind, right, you begin to have the mind of Christ. When it comes in and affects your emotions, right, in a positive way, you're able to endure suffering and hardship as a good soldier, as it were. When it affects your will, you make choices, that you used to didn't do when you lived in darkness. Now you make these choices. When that light comes in to illuminate your mind, your will, and your emotion, it is supposed to then flow out of you. And the, the different colors represent all the different ways we can work for God, and we can make an impact. Sometimes it's with words. Sometimes it's a meal. Sometimes it's just loving on someone, praying. But there's all these different ways that it happens. Check this out. That light isn't supposed to get trapped in who you are. So we think about that triangle like your life, the light doesn't just go in there and get stuck like in a box. It's supposed to flow in and through you and in multiple ways to affect multiple people so that those in darkness can come to find their life in Christ. Just like you, who was once in darkness, have been led out of that darkness into life and light in Christ. Think about that triangle like so many churches. So many churches, the light comes in and they sing and we got a light show and there's great teaching and, and, and you see what I'm saying? But the light gets stuck like a club. Like the whole purpose is we all get together and we sing Kumbaya. And we don't, we don't do anything collectively, but we pat ourselves on the back for loving God like we do. That is not the purpose of a church. It's not the purpose of your life. Light is to flow into you. Light is to flow into the church and out of that in multiple ways to affect those walking in darkness. So how are you doing with this in this season then? In this challenge of recognizing light has come into darkness and into your darkened heart, how are you doing that with reflecting it to others, at illuminating Jesus to others, at bringing light to darkness, at doing good works versus just sitting and coming to church? That is not a good work, by the way. I mean, it's good you do it, and I want you to come. <laughs> but this is the locker room. That's not points on the board. Points on the board begin the second we end the service for the next six days, right? How are we doing then? And again, this is why we are. This is why we came to this community, uh, Mosaic, to illuminate Jesus, to bring light to darkness, hope to hopelessness. That's why this church was established, right? And to do good works for those not otherwise accustomed to them in this part of our city. You know, this past Thursday, we had our Thanksgiving festival, as I mentioned, and I pulled off I-30, and I was right up here at university, and I was turning left to come to the church, and, and there was a guy on the so, uh, side of the road with a street sign, right? And you see him, you know, typically we say oh, it's a homeless person, but we don't know that they're always homeless. There, there's all kinds of people, unless you talk to them, maybe you don't know, right? But it was a cold, rainy day, if you remember right, and so we were stopped at the light, and I was trying to get here, you know, and trying to get here on time, so to speak, and... and um, and in the car in front of me, I saw the lady roll down a window. She threw, put out a dollar or something, a bill, and he took it, right? Put it. So then it came to me. Now, I don't know if you know American football, but if you're a quarterback, you run through your progressions, they call it. So when they send out receivers, they send out three or four receivers if you drop back to pass, and a good quarterback goes through his progressions. You got progression one, two, three, four, and you look for the openings, right? I got to tell you, in my humanity, I see somebody like on the street, my first progression, my first thought is just pass them on by. Man, I'm not going to give that person money. They're going to spend it on alcohol, drugs, whatever. I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> but that's my first read. That's my first progression. And I got to check that. See, according to check that, I'm not, I'm not going to look at that. I'm going to look at the next progression. So I go to the next progression. So the next progression is like, I, I'm thinking, well, you know, it's Thanksgiving after all, and, you know... Uh, it, yeah, you know, I got a nice fire and family to go home to. So I, I look in my little, my little uh, cup holder. And, you know, I got like three quarters, a dime, and a penny. I don't know where all this stuff comes from, but it just sits there sometimes. So I got it in there. So I start to reach in and grab these little coins. I'm going to give it to this guy. But then I went through another read. And my next progression was like, now, wait a second. We got four or 500 people up here. We got a hot meal. We got a nice family environment. It's not a soup kitchen. We're going to love on these people. And so I roll my window and I say, hey, uh, I don't know if you know, but right up the street a couple miles, we got a big old nice Thanksgiving dinner family. He's like, do you? I said, yeah, I said, well, why don't you get in? Come on, I'll take you there. He hurriedly grabs his stuff, gets off. He's excited. He's got a smile on his face. He jumps in the car. So we start driving down the road. 
I start hearing about his story. The fact is he's not homeless. He stands on that street corner, as he has for the last couple months, making $45 a day trying to so he can pay the hotel bill for him and his wife. They came up from Texas because his aunt, the only person in his whole life, in his world family, sick and dying. So they came here to care for the aunt. They're living in the hotel, 45 bucks. They left jobs that they had to be up here. They don't have any more resources, no more family. They're in the hotel off of uh, Scott Hamilton, 45 bucks a day, tries to make it so they can stay up here. They're headed back to Texas this coming Friday. So I hear that. So I go, your wife's in the hotel right now? He goes, yeah, is she ready? He goes, yeah, she's ready. I said, let's go get her. So I drive over, we pick up his wife. So now we're coming down the street, I'm listening to their story and, 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 and talking to them, whatever. They come here, they have a great meal, they stay for two hours, they eat, they're warm, they go home with boxes, you know, all the food like this. And on the way home, that's when I learned that they're going back to Texas this week because the aunt, I don't remember if she passed or, her, her, or she's in a hospice, they, they can't do any more for her. So they, they got plans, they got, they got a bus ticket and they're headed back to Texas this week and they can get their jobs, I talked to them about all this stuff. So. Anyway, uh, so I'm going back, so I'm dropping off the hotel. Now I'm thinking that because I picked this guy up, he's not been on the street corner. So he's not making his 45 bucks and how he's gonna pay for his hotel that night, right? So then I'm prompt, I say, you know what? I, I, let me, I get to the place, I go, I'd like to, I, I, let me pay for your hotel. You, you kind of kind of took you out of work for the day, so to speak, you know? And uh, let me just pay, and he's like, oh man, they were, they, oh man, I, I can't, even, they couldn't even express their gratitude. But by the time I got to the front desk, I couldn't just give him one day, I gave him four days. Because I'm thinking Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I get to go home to a nice meal and family and a warm fire, and this poor brother's gotta get out there and struggle for another few days. Maybe if I can take him through the weekend four days, I'll give him a little break. Then get back out there through four days, go to Texas. And they were so thankful and blown away. Now, I wanna be really clear why I told you that story and why I didn't tell you that story. I did not tell you that story for you to think, Mark DeMoss, oh, he's so cool, he did that, what a great guy. What, I promise you, that is not at all why I told you that story. But the reason that I did tell you that story uh, is simply uh, to say this, that this church, that, that story is the heart of this church. That is the heart of this church. And this church, and that heart was established 19 years ago by people who asked themselves this question, how many more Bible studies do we need? How many more songs do I need to sing? How many more times will I greet and socialize from Sunday to Sunday with people I already know who already know Jesus? How many more times do I need to pray before I step out in faith courage and sacrifice to make my life a prayer to you. You know, when I became a Christian in the late 70s, early 80s, I, I, I say that I got discipled by a man named Keith Green. I never met him, but he was a singer and recording artist and, and he made these albums and I listened to him over and over again. But one of his songs was Make My Life a Prayer to You. Because there's a lot of people who sit and pray all day long, and you should, and it's good, and there's nothing wrong with that, and that's the foundation for everything. But if you don't get up off your knees and get after it, you see what I'm saying? Because your life is supposed to be a prayer. Not just your words to Jesus, but your work for Jesus. That's a prayer too. And he said, make my life a prayer to you. And this is the legacy, fast forward 19 years, that you have inherited by being part of this church. It's the foundation upon which we have been called in this day to build upon. And we call all of you to build upon it with us. That is the heart of this church. And we do this work for God, not just individually. So on Thursday, I did an individual good work for God, whereby the light of God could bounce off me and illuminate someone else and bless and etc. But then collectively on Thursday, we did a good work. You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's you individually and it's us collectively always illuminating the heart of God for those we come in contact with. Wherever you find yourself from day to day, whatever your profession, whatever your job, etc., being that way. You know, to live like that, I can promise you, is not easy. It's not often that we see it. It's very hard for Christians in the American church today to live uh, like this in an age of self-absorption. That's just the fact. This is an age of self-absorption. And it is very difficult 
for Christians in the West and in the American church to break themselves of self-absorption to live for someone besides themselves. Not easy, very hard. It always comes with a cost. It did for Jesus, why wouldn't it you? See, we all wanna follow Jesus till it times time to getting beaten and going to the cross. It requires a willingness, however, to go, to live as he wants us to live. From Genesis 12, Abram, leave your family, your fathers, the land, leave your church, leave everything you know. Where am I going? I'll show you when you get there. He never got there. He never saw it in this life. But he went immediately, Matthew 4, uh, Genesis 12, 4. Jesus, Matthew chapter 4, he says this. It, it says that the very start in Matthew 4, it's the beginning of his public ministry. And it says that it, it says right there in Matthew 4 that he withdrew into Galilee and left Nazareth. Now, you may not know these terms, but think about this. Nazareth was his family, his home. It's where he's born and raised. He left it and he went to the Galilee. Now, the Galilee was a place that wasn't just Jews. It was Gentiles too. In fact, it was a lot of Gentiles and it had been conquered 700 years before by the Assyrians. So this is like a godless, darkened place. And it says that he went to the Galilee and he came and he settled in that land in Capernaum, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Again, this is an area where there were many unbelievers. No Jews. I mean, Jews weren't even believers, right? They were Jewish, but they weren't Christians, if you will. And on top of that, there's all these Gentiles. And Jesus left everything behind in Nazareth, and he went and he lived in that land. He didn't have to. It was hard, but he did it so that all could know him as we do. It requires a willingness to sacrifice of what you might otherwise have so others can have something too. Did you catch that? That's the Christian life. Giving up some of the things you might otherwise have so that others can have something too. It requires a determination to live for others, not for yourself. An understanding of postponed gratification. It requires faith. So in Hebrews, it says this, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith, Rahab the harlot did not perish along with those who were disobedient after she welcomed the spies in peace. And what more shall I say? For time will fail me if I tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war. Women received back their dead by resurrection and others were tortured, not accepting their release. They didn't accept their release. Why? so that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others experienced mockings and scourgings, yes, also chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were tempted, they were put to death with the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, they were destitute, afflicted, ill-treated, men and women of whom the world is not worthy, wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And all of these, having gained approval through their faith, did not receive in this life what was promised because God had provided for them something better. And therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us in our day also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. For consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself, and paid such a price, consider him, and in this way you will not grow weary and lose heart. You know, there's nothing I imagine that Jesus would like more for his birthday this year than to see us not just speaking words and worshiping, but doing good works in his name because of him. Walking out this truth, illuminating the light of the world through our persistent efforts, individually and collectively, do this and you will live. Steve Camp once wrote a song called Light Your Candle. He said this, you've been standing on the edges, hesitant to get involved. You're good at riding fences, but your problems go unsolved. Your light's under a bushel. It's been hidden on a hill. Oh, you tell me that you love him, but you fail to do his will. You look so safe and warm in your life of in-betweens. You don't want to touch nobody who will rip you at the seams. I know it's hard to live for him in a dry and weary land, but if you want to share in heaven on this earth, you've got to make a stand and light your candle. Light your candle. Light your candle on the front porch of hell. The star of Bethlehem shines luminous, not just so we can see it, but that by it we may shine illuminated 
so others can see it too and follow the path to Jesus. Heavenly Father, may our light so shine that they will see our good works from day to day and come to know you as we do. In Jesus' name we pray.